learned that prophecy has a future tent in it. It's the gift to the word of wisdom and operation because the word of wisdom is future tense. We learned that. So, this is a kind of a... Deb was questioning me about the spelling of this divers because King James has divers tongues, you know. And so I, I shared with her that's in the King James. And I did look it up and confirm it. So, the new King James... Divers. divers. So the new King James has different kinds of tongues and you understand that a little more. Amplified various, various, that's kind of brown kind of coming out. Various, various kinds of tongues amplified. And I think this last one really does a good one that speaks in various kinds of unknown languages. That's the voice. Because these are unknown to us. And I was thinking when I was looking at this earlier, I wonder how many languages there are, you know. And so I looked up and uh, there's 7,099 wow. languages as of 2000. 18, there's three that got lost from last year. Wow. So that's quite a bit, uh, I was thinking, you know, 20 or 30, yeah. I don't know, that's yeah. naive, naive, I guess. And so uh, there's 46 languages which only a single speaker. So I don't know if that means a single person knows that. There's 46 of those, I don't know. So anyway, that's, uh, it could be somebody studying the, and discovering the language perhaps. I wonder if Klingon is like Klingon. So Don't be sorry. And so we, uh, so what the blessing part about that is, you know, it's uh, unknown to us, but there's 7,099 languages. And uh, I think that's so cool, though. You know, we can pray in those and strictly to God. And I'm sure it's COVID where the enemy doesn't understand what it is. That's my belief in you. Well, I just want to, this is where I'm going to shift, and you can turn to the next page here. Right. Now, I've got the headline there, Tongues, and you see this, and you go, what's that have to do with Tongues? Or anything else like that. Well, I got, uh, this is where I got saved at, me and my friend Mike. Actually, he was homeless. I, uh, instead of him being homeless, we got this teepee here in the winter of 1982, and we uh, moved in to, uh, January 17th, and it's 20 below zero. But we were seeking the Lord. We were seeking the Lord there in that, and uh, he was a backslidden, separate Baptist. You know, they got all kinds of Baptists, uh, and his was a separate Baptist, or separate from the other. Serious. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so the Lord was dealing his heart because he got saved in youth camp. He was like 13, so he knew the way back. Uh, because we started going to his church and the Lord was, like I said, dealing with both of us there when we moved in January. And so we started going to his family church and they say you need to repent and get saved. And, well, I knew there's something here that's supposed to transpire to, you know, the salvation thing. It took me anyway until March to figure it out. But, uh, and so, you know, they, you go to the altar, a lot of these places, they'll just leave you there and don't know if you're waiting for a bolt of lightning or what it is. There's other people getting, getting up and joyful and this and that. And, uh, and so anyway, I think I'd say I shared the story here before. I finally just went down to the altar and it was a revival meeting. And it's because like Jesus, I could feel the presence in the room. And I, so I just went down to the altar. That's what everybody else did. But this time I just laid it down. I said, you know, Lord, I'm just sick and tired of this way I'm living, I just give it over to you. Mm. And I just heard the Father say, son, everything's okay. Mm. You can rise up. And so what I did is like an electrical flushing out mm. through my body and I stood up in a Baptist church, separate Baptist church, my hands <laughs> raised up. Now anyway, I went, uh, I went there for a year and a half. And I'm just sharing this because I had, as a heathen and heathens, didn't know anything about Christianity. And so I had a fresh I didn't have any religious spirits <laughs> background or wrong teaching. But uh, and so right away they saw the transformation and they wanted uh, me to be a Sunday school teacher for these third graders and uh, assistant uh, super Sunday school superintendent and 
youth this and that. And he's like, I don't know the word. How am I supposed to? You know, I need to learn the word. Well, you'll, you'll figure it out. Mm. But anyway, it's a good time. You know, the foundational things, only thing, a lot of times they would give altar calls to people already saved, and that's the only thing. And, you know, I shared before we started studying First Corinthians about the gifts. We got to through 10 Corinthians. We got to the gifts that he would say, those are not for today and such. So that's when I started having questions for them. So I'm going to uh, go into these questions I had and their answers. Mm -hmm. And I just want to especially get this on the ones that will be coming and the ones that will be viewing this to how, you know, Scripture says my people perish or they lose strength because of lack of knowledge. So that's all they've been taught. And a lot of them old timers and they're I call them hard shell Baptist. You know, they're set in their ways. And uh, so this is some of them, some of the questions I had. Now this next slide here, I took, I had, uh, some of you seen it, it was on uh, Peter's uh, denial of Jesus, and the Lord gave me a download of how he had a traumatic experience of that, of that and it went deep. Anyway, you can look on my Facebook page on, on their uh, May the 14th, and read all that. But I took this picture out. But one of my questions was, you know, Jesus said, you know, Satan desires to have you, sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that when you are converted, you know, you'll strengthen your brother. And I said, what does that mean when you get saved? Converted, is it? And they really didn't have a straight answer, but I, I kind of thought they thought to, uh, uh, are those disciples saved before the cross? Are those ones in the old covenant? Are they saved? You know, so these are some of the kind of questions I probably drove them. That's all the questions I had. But I was just hungry for the truth. And I ended up digging some, finding some stuff, you know, the Lord leads us to some real deeper truths if you have, don't have that background. But anyway, the, the Greek word there, I'm not. Uh, theologian to pronounce those, but there it is. Now the the first one's converted means to turn oneself about and turn back. So that's almost like repentance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure Peter had some repentance anyway. That's uh, this is after he got healed and turned back, you know, to the Lord. And uh, that just is a marvelous picture of Jesus just is healing that deep uh, traumatic experience and you see that when he came back on the shore and asked him do you love me and as that process Peter didn't confess yes I love you you know and so anyway the second word there is repent and that means to change one mind and so that's all in the process of repentance and the next slide there uh, and that's what was happening to me when I was living in TP sick in the Lord I would stop doing things that I had a conscious that I didn't have before, I guess, you know, in this time period of seeking the Lord. So actually I had the gift of repentance, turning, changing my mind and in that process, but it wasn't until I did that full surrender at the, you know, this. But Romans uh, 10 here says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there is that part. And believing the simple gospel, and that's what we need to really keep in mind. We have people coming off the streets, and when we hear there that we have a simple, just that you know, Jesus came, he was of a virgin, and that he was spotless, sinless Son of God, died for our sins so we could be reconciled back to the Father, and, and then went up after the third day, and he's coming back. So that's just a simple thing in that, and just share. Your own personal testimony, how you just gave your, your total heart to Him, surrender. And keep it simple as possible. Especially people's, uh, I think mine spans are shorter nowadays, you know. So, and so verse 13 says also, For whoever call the name of the Lord shall be saved. And also it talks about call while He's near. And this is a good one too, because this is a process of this for. In 1 Corinthians 7, 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. The sorrow of the world produces death, and that's so true. 
and now that the enemy will keep us in the sorrow and condemnation and the land leads to death. So, that's my question I have all good that I had for the separate Baptist. Hmm. Now, I have, we do uh, worship and regular services feeds on the outs. You know, I've got people from South Korea and different ones watching. These two I'm talking about, the pastors watch, or his wife does. She watches. Who does? Separate Baptists. Oh. They're still there. Oh, wow. And they watch. Cool. Hallelujah. Okay, so the question I had, when were the disciples saved, or when did they receive their salvation, before the cross or after? And I don't think, like I said, there's like a confusion in that area. Was it when the blood came down and resurrected, or was it before that. Now we see John, he preached repentance, and we saw Jesus, we know, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when I taught on the power of the blood, I referenced uh, Revelations, uh, I think it's 13, it says that Jesus is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world there. And so, clearly, you see, salvation is for the whole man, and through the blood of Jesus, that was the Lamb, and that he was slain from the foundation of the world. God had a plan already in that, you know, the healing and the deliverance and such. So, uh, when I see the, the, Old, the Old Testament covenant, even back to Adam and Eve, you know, when he, after they sinned, he killed an animal and wasn't behind a tree, he slew those animals right in front of them to just to show how severe their sin was, you know, there's no doubt the animals that they named and such. And it's probably a bloody mess, you know. And taught them, you know, the animal sacrifices, and it's probably a lamb, I'm sure. And taught them that, you know, but, and they had faith and obedience, what God said, slaying the blood. And doing those things, that was all pointing back to the fountain. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, up even to the cross. And to that, you know, so he's pulling it backwards and frontwards, if you, if you will, in that because God's out of time. He's not in this, this time. So that's why we see in Matthew, uh, this is a pretty cool, verse 14. Now, when Jesus had come to Peter's house, uh, he saw his wife's mother lying sick of a fever. And verse 15 says, so he touched her hand and the fever left. And then the other gospel account it says he rebuked it. So it kind of makes me think I might have been a spirit there. And she arose and served him. And when the evening came, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, and he cast them out, out the spirits, which had uh, with the word, and healed all that were sick. And uh, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and this is talking about Isaiah 53. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And so this is the, the account in Isaiah 53, just the work of the cross. And Jesus has said it's fulfilling by healing the sick and stuff. Can you see this? So he transcends time. So my thoughts, uh, you know, the old covenant the sacrifices, he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And on this side is the blood of the cross. He, you know, he sees the beginning from the end, so he's pulling and doing those things through that blood, and through the blood he shed, doing that. Because when it says it fulfills that, ultimately it fulfills on the cross those things, you know, by his stripes and such we are healed. So that's my conclusion, disciples were saved. Because he chose each one of them, he came to them, and a lot of them are fishermen, he says, you know, follow me, and they just dropped everything, followed. All of them, and, uh, and even tax collectors, which were, you know, Matthew was a despised tax collector, and all those other ones, and they just stopped what they did, and, and like Zac, was a Zacchaeus, mm -hmm. who did the returned, all the money that he stole. So you see the, the fruits of repentance through that, so they were saved, I mean, even under that, before the cross. It looks pretty plain to me, so. Yes.
So, I have a question. When, so, when do we receive the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When are we saved? So, I already covered that first one. So, the second one, I ask that because by this time I I could hear the Lord and He would uh, confirm things and, I, and just electrical presence all the time upon me. And uh, like I said, I was a year and a half in the Baptist church and, and this time I had a charismatic uh, boss, kitchen manager. He kept saying, you need a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I go back to the Baptist church and I know you got it when you was born again. And then my uh, boss, he would give me some scriptures, and then he'd give me some cassette tapes on the subject and then the word. And uh, so I, I had a hard time reconciling because I hear the voice of the Lord, you know, and the Lord would tell me to do something. In one instance, uh, they had a big, at that separate Baptist, they had, it was a camp meeting place there where all the associations would come there and have a camp meeting. So they had hundreds of people there. The Lord told me to, I think it was in Romans, picked a scripture out, he goes, I want you to speak this at this camp meeting. And so he told me to put my blue suit on. And so I went in and I got there a little, just right before it started, sat down. I sat there about five minutes and this person came across, asked me if I could give a, a scripture and prayer for that big congregation. I was like, I already got it. <laughs> and it was just things like that. Uh, Lord would lead us to houses to pray for people. And this one, uh, they just would not. And he was begging them to get saved. And it was like a week later, he got a motorcycle wreck and killed. And, and there's like a series, like six or seven different people like that would come across. And then like a week later, they would die one way or another. It's kind of spooky there as well. But Lord was given that last chance. But just hearing that and confirming that uh, so we see here under A I was told that when you're born again you see the Holy Spirit because you know John talks about that so which is born of the flesh is flesh and that is born of the spirit of spirit but the thing is I've learned through the years that the Holy Spirit is the working agent of the Godhead you see that throughout and from the beginning and there we see this in the next slide uh, do the Father has the plan, because that's really good. That's a lot. The Father has the plan, the Son speaks it forth in the Holy oh, Spirit. Oh, that part, yeah, so. So he's the working agent of the, whole, of the Godhead. The Father has a plan, the Son speaks it out, speaks it forth, and the Holy Spirit goes out, makes it happen. And with that, I believe the angels are released with that. Right. So we see an example of that in the beginning is pretty familiar. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was out of form of void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was, or the, yeah, the Spirit of God was hovering, or the other word is, uh, what is the other word? You can know it any other time. It's, it's kind of heavy. Just hovering over the waters. Brooding. Brooding, that's it. That's, brooding, or hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was. So, the, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit one, but yet they're three different. So that kind of messes with people's minds. Okay, and then Genesis 2, also, in creation of man, Genesis 1, 26, 27, God said, now this is how we amplify, let us pretty cool how they separate. And God said, let us Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make man in our image according to our likeness. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image and likeness of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. <laughs> so you see they're all in the, they're all in that part of it. Yeah. Holy Spirit being that uh, the working agent uh, does the actions in the Godhead. This is what I believe is why the but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, you know, it says, we'll read here and then, that cannot be forgiven, is the fact of that. And that's why Jesus said, uh, you know, believe me for my work's sake. 
because it's the works of the Holy Spirit, and that's why the Holy Spirit, you know, that's why it's not to be messed with. So we'll look at those scriptures here. The one I have written down on the board is Luke twelve ten. If anyone speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now he's de dealing with those Pharisees and those were real religious, uh, religious spirits when he's talking to them. But I'm going to read out of uh, Matthew 12, 22-32, and it has this account here. Uh, and it gives you examples. So if you're here tonight, you haven't blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. And I believe some do it in ignorance, you know. It's just like them at the Baptist church. When we start talking about tongues, there were some old... Some of the old times said that's of the devil. Mm -hmm. And you just think that has to be just ignorance mm -hmm. and that that's not going to apply to them. And that's just how I see that. It's just those ones that know what they're doing. Those Pharisees and those scribes and the different ones, they knew. They seen the miracles, they seen all those things, but yet they just, you know, just wanted to gnash their teeth against him. Okay, it says, And then they brought to him ones possessed, demon possessed. Blind and mute, and he healed them, so that the blind and mute both uh, spoke and saw. And the multitudes were amazed, and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, and they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by bales above the ruler of the demons. And it's, but Jesus knew their thoughts, and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Satan cannot cast out Satan. He divides against himself. How then will this, his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, of whom your sons cast them out, therefore they shall be your judges. And so, you know, the, the children, you know, the, these Pharisees and such are looked up to as, you know, the fathers of the faith but their children will judge them for ones that are probably getting saved and casting out devils themselves but it says if I cast out demons uh, by the spirit of God surely the kingdom has come upon you and so it goes on to say he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say unto you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven of men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven of him, either in this age or the age to come. Now well, that's like, wow. <laughs> Wow, 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 I want to steer clear of that religious spirit. Mm -hmm. But can you see this? Because it's the Holy Spirit they are. Because he's doing the works of casting out demons and different things. It's that Holy Spirit and the empowerment that's going out and doing that. And he said, you can blaspheme against me, but you do it against the... So what about, you know, the, the Holy Spirit, God has a great regard for that part of the Godhead. So another part, Jesus sends a 70 out by two. So that's why we always say you need a partner when you go out to pray. Mm -hmm. It says with uh, power and authority in Luke uh, 10, 20. It says that he healed the uh, it it too. And heal the sick that are there and say unto him, the kingdom of God is at near unto you. And so when the, in verse 17, and when the 70 return again with joy, saying, Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. I'm going to make a point here. So we're going to do one more Matthew 10, verse 1 and verse 8. It says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness, all manner of diseases, to heal the sick, clean, cleanse the leper, Raise the dead and cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely you give. 
So you clearly see here they have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus gave them that power and authority in that. So there's a, you know, in the Old Testament, the, the anointing of the Spirit of God would come on for, a, you know, like Samson for different assignments and different ones. You can see the prophets and the different ones that come on. But it wouldn't abide on, on people like that. So this is just an impartation of that. And so this is why it was kind of confusing me. I was doing things... Um, you know, I felt like I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't really until I, uh, it was really, until I had that one scripture, I think it's uh, Luke 13, 11, it says, you know, your Heavenly Father will give you good gifts and He won't give you, you know, the rock or a snake or anything, but He said, how much more will He give you the, the Holy Spirit to them to ask? And I thought, uh-huh. <laughs> and the same about asking, you get it automatic, you know, according to that. But so it was October 16th, 7.30 in the morning, it was a Sunday. I asked, and I got it, and I started to, to speak in another language. And at the exact same time, within a three minute in that, my friend Mike, he saw, called me on the telephone. Right at the time I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said, well, I gotta go. And so, uh, okay, and I go, is this real? Is this, you know, trying to disruption there. So I went back in and just, I had to stop then. So, but I will say, I came down to a choice. Of, of, uh, my friend Mike, I was friend since third grade. <clears throat> and he could, he could uh, finish my sentences. We almost like we were twins or something. It's kind of pretty weird. But really close knit friends, but. After 1984, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was just like a wall went up. Mm -hmm. I had to go my separate ways. Yeah. That's separate a kind of hard. Huh? From the separate Baptist ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they kind of boast they came all the way back to John the Baptist. I know. It's like, okay. He lost his head, but anyway. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so we're getting close to something here. <laughs> so my fourth point tonight is John 14, 16, and 17. I get notice a lot of word, but it's good to get word in. And I will pray to the Father. So okay, here's what Jesus is saying. I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, and whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him. He dwells with you, and he shall be in you. So whatever experience the with you part, when I saw this, like, ah. So it's like having a glass of water, that's nice, that's lovely. That's more lovely when you get it inside you, yeah? yeah. <laughs> On a hot day. Right, right. That's really good. So, that is really good. So the disciples, they had the Holy Spirit experiencing the, the, the uh, power of God of seeing, you know, healings and deliverances yes. and such. But it's like, aha, uh -huh. I like that. He will be in you. And so then after the, the resurrection of Jesus, he was with 40 days, uh, you know, seeing Peter restored, helping him there. In John 20, verse 22, Jesus breathed on them and said unto them, Receive you the Holy Spirit. But they didn't receive the Holy Spirit right then, because he goes on, then we'll see. But I believe he's breathing on them to clear away the stuff that would hinder them from receiving, you know, or a prophetic act, if, if you were, you know, wall off all the confusion of, you know, they thought he was going to be the, you know, the, the king over Israel and the kingdom restored and all that, and, and, you know, all the confusion around after the crucifixion. So I think he's blown away a lot of that stuff and just has a prophetic act blowing mm -hmm. on him because this is before he went up to his ascension. So he tells him Acts 1 4, wait for the promise of the Father, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's why I was always convinced there because yeah. I was like, it's separate mm -hmm. because he's giving them a, a power. 
calmness and telling them that yeah. what I want you to do, yeah. that was that. Yeah. And so we'll, since it is a day of Pentecost, we'll read the account there. Okay. And it's fully coming you know? up. Yep. Mm -hmm. We need a fresh <laughs> So, and that's, uh, I'll read verse 4 of chapter from 1, but it says, And being assembled together with him, he commanded him not to depart to Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which he said to you, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so they, you know, 40 days, well, Pentecost what means is 50. And so Jesus was with them 40 days, so it was another 10 days they went to the upper room. So when we're done here, I'll have Deb Sherry when we're actually shipped into a new month, so we'll wait on that. Okay, chapter 2, verse 1, and we're going to read 1 through 4 for now. It says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, we were all one accord in one place, and then suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind filled the whole place where they were sitting. And that, that wind I heard, I tell you what, imagine this wind. You know, the Holy Spirit was like it. A dove came on Jesus at the baptism. But this time it came, you know, with a mighty rushing wind and with fire. Then it appeared, uh, it says clothing, clothing tongues, in uh, King James, this was divided tongues, as fire and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And so it's, uh, like I said before, it's, it's a supernatural thing, and that's where it has a, some people have a hard time, you know, that they think the Holy Spirit's going to move, move your mouth. And I've seen crazy things that, I don't want to name the church, anyway, it's a, a well-known uh, Pentecostal type church. But they would try to do things and move your time, or, and, and you got to do it this way, and no, you got to do it that way, and the poor person doesn't know what to was it think, but it's uh, yeah, so it comes down <laughs> to <laughs> so it's a supernatural thing, but it's a natural thing, yeah, mm -hmm. in our faith that uh, when we receive. But the unique thing about this, there were uh, people there from many nations. It says, uh, I won't name all of them, but there's they came for the, the feast and different things. There's uh, it says, uh, from all nations were there on tongues and different tongues. And so you hear people say that it was in the hearing that the miracle was, but they heard them in their own language. So I think, you know, they were 20 when they came out of there and they thought they were drunk and they were going, hallelujah, in one language and whoever the language that was picked it up. And that's how I see it anyway, because it's an unknown to them, but known to the other ones. Amen. Amen. And so, I was talking, telling Debbie, you know, there were 7,099 different languages. And I can remember hearing this one brother, because he won't be watching this, but it's uh, kind of a weird language. <laughs> but it could be possible, you know. That's a lot of different languages. So we see, anyway, that's, I really believe that's uh, the initial evidence of baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. And I'm going to clarify that. That's why I went through all this. It is the initial. Some people say, well, there's other. That's not necessarily the initial. There's others, and they list off the fruits of the Spirit. Well, that is, fruits of the Spirit comes with that. The initial is the evidence of speaking in tongues. And it's a very important thing as we are seeing, as we pray in the Holy Spirit discipline for half an hour, we're seeing things that happen. And there's a reason for that. The Lord once said back in His church that, Allow the Holy Spirit, which is God, to operate through us in praying. Because it, just the thing that the things, the Holy Spirit is God, and he, he knows what's going on out there. He can command angels to take care of that if you're releasing speaking forth. There's something about speaking forth. And we did a whole thing about the words of your mouth. You know, you be snared in life and death and the power of your tongue and so on. So there's power. And we can speak to this mountain and shall be renewed, cast see. So there's something. And it talks about earlier being salvation, we confess with our mouth 
you know, believe in our heart. So there's the words are very powerful. So the praying in the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to speak forth those things. So, so anyway, ten years later after Pentecost, the Gentiles there they received uh, the Holy Spirit. I'll just go. There's just a couple of verses. I think this is one Cornelius. We did that the last time we did. Um, I guess. Wait, it's that one. Let's see here. So it's Acts 10, 24. Yes, Cornelius. We did that one. We did the gifts of alms. That the angel was uh, came and visited because he the man gave alms. <clears throat> to the poor and such. And, and that's when they, you know, the message to Peter, the, you know, the sheets of unclean animals and such, that God said are, are clean. So that's what the context of this. So they went to the Cornelius' house and had a revival there. And so we see in, in, in verse 44, it says, When Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those that have heard the word. Even those of circumcision who believe were astonished as many as came to Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also before they heard them speaking in with tongues. That's how they knew. Mm -hmm. And mighty, <clears throat> and mighty, mighty find God. And Peter answered, Can any of you forbid water? Who received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Just as we have? So anyway, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. But anyway, he goes on over in 11, 15. Also it says, And as I began to speak, he's telling the story again. The Holy Spirit fell upon them as on us in the beginning. So that clearly shows you there that and as 10 years after Pentecost, And then 20 years after the day of Pentecost, we see in Acts 19. We will look at that real quick. I'm just uh, making a distinction here before I go to the gift of diverse tongues. We've got to establish first, see what uh, the initial evidence really is, and then do the distinction between the gift of that. So Acts 2, 9, 1 through 6. And it happened... Acts 16, 1, or Acts 19, 1 said it happened while Paul was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much heard what it be that the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and he said unto them, What then were you baptized? And they said to John's. And Paul said, and John indeed baptized the baptism of repentance, saying, you know, everyone come after him. Let's see how far I'm going with this. Six. Six, okay. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And then verse 20, I got something there, let's see what it is. So the word of the Lord grew, and it didn't sound like that's the one, though, does it? It grew magnified and mightily and prevailed, so that's a good thing anyway, even though it doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Just through that memory, I guess. Just the word of God, so it's going to be good. Okay, and then this one, the last, about, if you were, evidence, it doesn't say in this particular one, but it's Acts. 8, 13 through 18, but it says Simon the sorcerer. And it said that he believed, you know, and was baptized, I believe, in that passage there. But uh, when he saw, and when they laid the hands on, the Holy Spirit was given. So he saw something happen, that transaction it was given, and he wanted that power to do that. But just the point is, he saw something transpire, and I believe it's probably <clears throat> praying in the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, why should we pray in the Holy Spirit? So number one I have on here, or A, it says June 20, but you, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I try to share these scriptures with the separate Baptists. <laughs> and, they, and they thought it was prideful to build yourself up. That was her. Wow. They totally ignored this other, you know, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, really... To edify yourself was prideful. Wow. And contending for the faith was like contending I was. Mm -hmm. like fighting etc mm -hmm. I'm not putting down but you know people they believe what they believe in you kind of wonder so but here's one I really like uh, Romans 8 26 and 27 says likewise the spirit also helps our weaknesses but we do not know how to pray as we should we should pray or as we ought to, and, but the Spirit Himself makes an intercession for us with groanings. It says, Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So that's the big key, if you had any key out of the whole about this. He is God, he knows the will of God, because he is God. <laughs> and so I said, Yes. Uh, and so we'll see here coming up that Paul said I'll pray in the spirit I'll pray in the understanding so we release petitions of our voice and faith believing you know that's where we operate in our English you know our normal language uh, releasing faith uh, in prayers petitions and different things like that but wow you can pray about something and get a perfect prayer and don't mess it up you know Yep, get my soul in the way. Mm -hmm. So that's the best way to. Alright, what we got here? That's great. We're starting back with the gifts. How about that? So the divers came in tongues. Interpretation. So the key in 1 Corinthians 12 28. Let me look at that real quick. That's going to be fun when we do the gift of faith. Just be able to share all kinds of personal faith stories in my own life, history. You know. Okay, so 28 and 29. Now, this, the reason why I have this as a key. Because it shows you here the, that that particular gift, the diver's tongues, which means very, various different kinds of tongues, which I do have. Over in verse 28 and 29, it's talking about ministry gifts. So this is actually a ministry. Well, as we wrap up, we'll see that. That is a... And there's a distinction which we'll go through. What is the prayer language and what is the... When you have a tongue and see it interpreted, that's a that tongue part is what this part is here. So anyway, verse uh, 28 says, God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healing, helps, administration, and a variety of tongues. Are all apostles, all prophets, are all teachers? Are all miracle workers? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Uh oh. That's one they pull out. Uh -huh. Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And I speak to you more that way. In an excellent way. So, what do you think? So, it's talking about this, what I just said, that's. Uh, You've probably seen it. You probably know what this is about. That's why I didn't really spend the whole uh, session on just this. But you know, if you watch Glory Design and other places that we pray, we come together and pray in spirit. That's praying, which I'll probably have a scripture in the next couple of slides. But it's praying directly to God. 
in a church service, and especially chapter 14, he has regulations on how these things work. So when somebody has an anointing for times and they were overzealous, that's why he had to have this letter to put these regulations in. But they'd be just blurting out in tongues, but they were just doing it in zeal, but not coming under the order. If you have that anointing, you're going to bring forth that tongue, but you know you either have an interpretation of somebody in the death or that you be quiet. So there's two different things, the prayer language and it's this language for the tongue interpretation part. So that's what the, the divers kinds of tongues are more than likely ones that have more fluent, different languages has that gift. That's what that's trying to say, but not always. So that kind of clarifies on that particular. Are you in Skype now? <laughs> that's not mine, that's yours. Oh, my next one. My next one? Yeah. That's right. And so we're going to 1 Corinthians 14. Like I said, this regulates uh, of the service. I remember here in Smith Wigglesworth, they were doing a big conference and stuff, and, and it's time for him to speak. And it wasn't time for these the gifts to operate. And this guy just stood up and Ran loud in tongues and he just sit down. Because <laughs> I speak in tongues more than you know, but when I'm speaking, you don't speak. <laughs> so he's, he's a, a particular on divine order. Mm -hmm. And he would be sometimes really rough to protect that. So Paul's given the regulations here. He says, Pursue love. And that's because the, he just came out of 13 love. You can have all the gifts in the world, you don't have that. Love, it ain't going to mean anything. So that's why the love chapter, which we're going to get that worked in our hearts. That's what the Lord's doing. Yeah. Because no matter how, what uh, anointings we seem to have or gifts, if we don't have that operating in that love, yeah. you know, it's nothing, it says. And that it's, starts in this room. Yeah, so uh, it says pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. So they're supposed to desire especially that you may prophesy. For he that speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to men but to God. So he's talking about your prayer. For no one understands him, however, if the Spirit, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Verse 3 If he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men, but he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Here we go again. I got that throw it back at me. You just you're being built up in pride to try to turn that into. <clears throat> but he who prophesies edifies the church. And so we see in verse verses twelve to fifteen it says, Even so, since you are so uh, are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. So that's that gift he's trying to. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. For so what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray in the understanding. I will sing in the spirit. We do that here. And we also will sing in our understanding. So he's saying, you know, there's both. But there's a balance in regulations. So 26 and 28 said, How is it then, brethren? When you come together, each one of you has a psalm, you have a teaching, you have a tongue, you have a revelation. And has, is that? Has. An, has. An oh, has an interpretation. So the interpretation of revelation and tongues there, so that you should have. Hopefully have that. If not, we can, a lot of times we uh, can fill that in as well. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let him be two, or at the most three in each in turn. Let one interpret. Saul was here, not, was it last week when Chuck? He even asked, he told someone to come up to, because he felt that, yeah. that gift in operation. So one person, a lady, came up and gave the tongues, and there was like, Two or three others have the prophetic interpretation of that. So that's beautiful mm -hmm. to watch that. So that's why he's saying here that. But if there's no interpreter, 
let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. I think it's the last one on here, huh? Okay, 1 Corinthians 14, 39 and 40 says, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and forbid not to speak in tongues, that all things be done decently and in order. And so that's, uh, that kind of gives you a distinction there, because I have not back around for a year and a half anyway to have that discussion with them and see how they, <coughs> you know, they had a question when the salvation was before or after the cross or, and then that you know, be born again by the Spirit he's working agent he's doing a regeneration in you that's what he's doing that's what I felt flowing through me and so but distinctly there he dwells with us and then in us and then all the different times we shared there that uh, and they received that Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, that they began to speak in tongues. And so what the <clears throat> lovely part about that is if we continue from that day receiving, you know, the enemy tried to hit right at the beginning, you know, when I was receiving and operating that, and then get a phone call trying to get me away from that, yeah. from the Baptist brother, <laughs> Silver Baptist. And, uh, but I was determined to go back into that. And uh, a lot of times it'll cost you. Friends and stuff, they think, you know, it's big in times, like, why do they do that? That's not for today and all that, but uh, we need to really press more into that, I think, and that's to our personal life and corporately. So. so then we have a building, we can do that 24 hours, right? <laughs> we don't have to worry about going to bed. We can just relax and we've got a slope. Slope. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's about it. So, what was you want to share about the. Do you have enough? I don't have enough. We're in a new month, hallelujah. We're in a new month. We're in a so we'll find out Saban. what that is. Yes. We are in the month of Saban, and this is about all I know about it because I haven't studied it out yet, but it is about expanding our borders. Mm. So, how cool is that? It's the month of Zebulun, and it's about expanding yeah. borders. and wow getting that new place, so that's kind of prophetic and cool and awesome. As Jack was just kind of sharing, um, I think it was the, like the one before last scripture about, um, you know, do all things, you know, some will come with a psalm, some will come with a tongue, some will come with edification, a teaching, you know, and that doesn't mean necessarily, you know, an hour's teaching, but, you know, sometimes it can just be one scripture that the Lord has spoken to you that's really ministered, that you have some revelation on to be able to impart, and that's really why we encourage that here is to be a safe place and why we're pulling on you guys. What are you hearing from the Lord? What are you seeing? Because you have something. It's not about ever about us standing up here and having it all. Far, far from it. You, you know, we all bring our song. I love to hear when we're singing in the spirit. And, you know, tonight, just as we were crying out for that fresh outpouring and got to the point, even with our canned music, where there was lulls in it, but you guys were all pressing in with your song, your sound. And it's like, I felt like that was that demonstration and even that scripture. You know, Tanya comes with her sound. Cece comes with her sound. I love it. I love to hear you, Cindy. You come with a sound. You're a worshiper, and to be able to have that activated, oh, we all do. We all come with our with our sound, and um, it's about a heart condition and that love. But we all have a peace, yeah. and how can we activate that? Because we all want to grow in that, and this to be a, a safe place. And even when the Boundaries do get expanded. We've still got to have the love, but it's still got to be that that training center to equip and that you can walk out confidently knowing the love of the Father, knowing Jesus, and co-laboring with Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so that's what that's what I wanted to stir up to question what is my gift. You know, because said he sets every person in as it pleases him and he gave the gifts and unfortunately a lot of places don't even let those 
be exercised. And, but it's just strange. Just imagine, you know, it's, he gives it an example of, you know, the body, the different gifts. And if they're not being used, you know, they just kind of, you know, just kind of limp hand and such. And so, Father, I just pray right now. We just want a healthy body to represent you, Lord. The full package, Lord, just the, the love of the Father in our hearts. And as we minister these gifts, and you said you set them in the church to operate, Lord. And, and so we just declare just a, a new activation even in that, Lord. And you said the desire, in one place, desire the best best gifts uh, or the, something uh, that effect or desire the spiritual gifts, Lord. So you, we can also receive, I believe, we have a, uh, he probably even puts that in us, a desire for a certain gift. And if we pray that and believe that and we feel that mm -hmm. in our hearts, then that will start to manifest because he said to mm -hmm. desire those spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. And he also says he gives those. Mm -hmm. So Father, I just thank you just stirring our hearts up and nice. Yeah. Bless your people here and the ones that will be watching on the well. Mm -hmm. the Lord, that they'll give just a piece of something after all these scriptures, your word that we read tonight, Lord, that will be clear in our minds. And and that even in your sleep, Lord, you'll reveal things. We just declare this is a, a time of revelation and hearing more clearly. And, and not only just hearing, but doing what we hear you speak, Lord, and show us. So we just speak uh, divine blessings and health. I know there's some that their enemies trying to attack through sickness. We pray for you now. Yes. Rebuke that infirmity, those yes. viruses, the bugs that that uh, the virus, that's uh, germs and other things passing from one to another. We just say that this is now, in Jesus' name, we just speak healing to the ones that applies to their watching, and even the ones here that have symptoms. We just declare that to be burnt out through the Holy Spirit right now, through the blood of Jesus, be cleansed out of your body. And Lord, I just ask protection over us. Keep us healthy, Lord. You said you desire that we be in health and prosper, Lord, and our soul to prosper. So that's our prayer in Jesus' name. I got a couple of things to, to add on. Um, it's an old book, but there's a resource over there, and you know, it's just a couple of bucks. Just throw it in the bucket. But it's um, on praying in tongues, and it's a great little resource. If you want something more extensive, Bill Hannah's book, <coughs> 70 Reasons to Pray in, the, Pray in Tongues, is an incredible book. You know, and I think that was just as, as God was restoring these different things, and we saw that, you know, with the outpouring in, in Wales and in Azusa, part of what got poured out and reintroduced into the body was tongues. Mm -hmm. You know, that was that empowerment and we desperately need that now, I think, more than ever. And we're seeing, you know, even from testimonies within our lower group, as we've started really pressing and praying in tongues, um, the shifts and the changes and, and being built up in your most holy faith and, and the revelation that's coming. So I just encourage you, that's a great little resource. It's a really quick read, but good, good stuff in there, good sound um, teaching and, and the word in there. Um, and I think just to finish up, you know, we leak. You know, we need that fresh outpouring. You know, it's not a one and done. You know, yes, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, but we are to be constantly refilled. You know, it's just like to use Jack's glass of water. You know, you can have the glass of water, you can drink the glass of water, but then you need more water. Yeah. And, you know, just to... That, that fresh outpour and that fresh infilling because we leak and we need to be constantly pressing in and tapping in. Even Acts 3 going to 4, they're persecuted for that healing. I think it's the lame man perhaps. Yeah. And gave beautiful. They're persecuted and it talks about they came together and just believing for boldness, more boldness and such. Uh, and then it said that things shook, I think, and then they're all filled. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, so, continue on feelings. And you see that in the Word of God. So, as it's Pentecost, <laughs> let's all stand.
Mm. And we will not be here Thursday. Yes, Friday. we will not be here Thursday. We're going to be down in Yuma. Oh, just a reminder for that. So, Father, we just... We thank you that you are a good Father and that you have given us as an incredible, amazing gift, Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And Lord, I know my heart's prayer is, Holy Spirit, I want to know you more. I want to know how to co- cooperate with you more. Mm-hmm. That you are the agent in the earth realm today. And how we can co-labor with you. But as we come and we celebrate your outpouring with the with the wind and the tongues of fire. And as we've been crying out, even tonight in our worship, we need a fresh outpouring. We need a fresh outpouring individually. I know I need a fresh outpouring, Lord. And corporately. That's our heart's cry. Come, Holy Spirit. I'm just reminded of Catherine Coleman. And how she would just weep. And she'd say, but Holy Spirit is all I have. Holy Spirit, you are all we have. And may we never forget that. May that be the cry of our heart. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. More of you, Holy Spirit. And I pray for a fresh baptism for each one here tonight and each one that will listen in the days to come. And I just pray, even for those that, in times to come, that might might not have fully received that, that there's maybe some doctrine in your past, where that there's there's even been mindsets where you've gotten in agreement, and that's been a hindrance to you receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I just want to pray for you right now and just, um, it's easy, you just repent, just as Jack shared. You repent, you turn away from that, and you renounce that, that lie that you've maybe gotten in agreement. Maybe it was even as a child. Hmm. And it's hindered you from receiving the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. And I just pray for you right now. I pray for the revelation. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Make us ready for all that you have in store for us in the future. We love you, Jesus. It's all for your kingdom. All for your glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. Thank you, Jesus.